When we think of Galadriel, we tend to think of like elven perfection, right? But Galadriel was not always quite so perfect. A la Tulia Meldonia, a Haramari essay. My name is Rainbow Dave, and welcome to another Tolkien fun fact video. So, one of the reasons that I love the wider legendarium of Professor Tolkien so much is that when you scratch the surface, he takes a number of the characters that we all know and love from The Lord of the Rings, and he illuminates a whole extra layer of their story and their character. And in my opinion, one of the best examples of this is the Lady Galadriel. Now, everyone who's read The Lord of the Rings knows who Galadriel is, but it's only after reading the Silmarillion that we truly discover who Galadriel is, like right at her core, and who she was before that. So, today's fun fact is going to chronicle the ages of Arida from the perspective of Galadriel. And hopefully, this information will make her character seem even more awesome. Now, I feel that at the very heart of Galadriel's character, there is an internal duel between her ambition and her wisdom. On the one hand, she is among the wisest beings in the entire legendarium. The only other people on her level, at least in the Third Age, would be the likes of Gandalf, or Círdan, or Elrond. And yet, unlike the other bearers of the Elven Rings, Galadriel is not defined by her humility. Quite the opposite, in fact. For better or for worse, Galadriel is afflicted with ambition. And more than once throughout her story, Galadriel is forced to choose between her conflicting wisdom and her pride. But anyway, the first thing that I ought to say about Galadriel which is something that I feel like most of you already know, is that she is old. Like, very old. Like, older than the sun kind of old. And she wasn't even born in Middle-earth. No, she was born in the undying lands that lie to the west of West. The land of Valinor. And even from birth, Galadriel was kind of a big deal. Her father was a prince of the Noldor, and her mother was a princess of the Teleri, and her grandmother was a lady of the Vanyar. So, Galadriel can trace her lineage to all three of the clans of the High Elves in Valinor. But, Galadriel's story truly begins when she develops a relationship with her uncle, Feanor. Now, if you've seen some of the other videos on this channel, then you'll already know all about Feanor. He is the arrogant genius who forged the titular Silmarils in the Silmarillion. And in the beginning, his story is very closely connected to his nieces. You see, Galadriel actually served as a, a sort of inspiration for the Silmarils of Feanor in the first place or at least her hair did. So in the unfinished tales, Tolkien tells us that Galadriel's hair was held a marvel unmatched. It was golden like the hair of her father and of her foremother Indus, but richer and more radiant. For its gold was touched by some memory of the star-like silver of her mother. And the Eldar said that the light of the two trees had been snared in her tresses. Now, this is particularly special because, of course, these two trees are the source of all light in the world. And this light comes from the gods. So Galadriel's hair is a lot more than just pretty to look at. But anyway, the first example of Galadriel's internal conflict between her wisdom and ambition comes when she first begins to discuss the lands of Middle-earth with her uncle Feanor. Now, it's important to remember that Middle-earth is a place that neither Galadriel nor her uncle had ever seen or set foot upon. They were both born in the Undying Lands. They are natives of paradise. And yet, in her youth, Galadriel's ambition blinded her 
to this reality. You see, at this early point in the tale, both Galadriel and Feanor seek power above all else. And Galadriel makes the decision that one day she will leave the Undying Lands and she will rule a kingdom of her own in Middle-earth. But I certainly don't want to imply that Galadriel was ever foolish. She may be ambitious, but her wisdom is ever-present. And we can see this in the unravelling of her relationship with Feanor. So Feanor's wrath and his temper mixed with his fiery pride soon became too much for Galadriel to bear. And this is where her hair comes back into play. So just before Feanor forged the Silmarils, the things he's most famous for forging, he asked Galadriel for a strand of her gold and silver hair. But Galadriel saw darkness in her uncle and she refused him. Now three times Feanor requested a tress of her hair and three times she refused him. Not even a single strand did she give. Now what makes this especially interesting is that if we skip forward in time, about seven and a half thousand years, we'll come to a familiar scene from the Fellowship of the Ring. And Gimli will also ask Galadriel for a strand of her hair. And what does she do? She gave me three. So make of that what you will. But anyway, without wanting to get too bogged down in details, the darkness of Feanor eventually erupts into a full-blown rebellion when he leads a small faction of the most radical and prideful Noldor away from the West in the hopes of going to war in Middle-earth. And every single woman of the Noldor rebukes Feanor. His wife, his sisters, his stepmother, all of them refuse to join him on his outrageous mission. Except for Galadriel. Due to her ambition, she stands alone as the only woman amongst the Noldor to march to war alongside Feanor. But once again, Galadriel is soon forced to choose between ambition and wisdom. Because before Feanor can sail east, he first needs ships. And the only fleet of ships in the west belongs to the Teleri, the Sea Elves of Alqualonde. So, Feanor demands that the Teleri give their ships to him, and when they refuse, Feanor initiates the first ever elf-on-elf -elf violence. So, this is one of the first true turning points for Galadriel. Because, although she is loyal to Feanor, and she desires to sail to Middle-earth as much as he does, Galadriel is not a murderer. She has the option to do evil, but she wholeheartedly refuses. And this is a very good thing because, remember, Galadriel's mother is one of the seafaring Teleri. And so, in this moment, Galadriel's wisdom far exceeds her ambition. But her ambition doesn't disappear. Because at this point, you would definitely be forgiven for thinking that Galadriel would simply turn away and leave her uh, psychotic uncle behind her. But this is not what happens. Her hands are completely unstained by the murders at Alqualonde, and so unlike her uncle, Galadriel does have the choice to repent and turn back. But she doesn't take it. She refuses to beg for pardon. She no longer has any love for her uncle, but her ambition still wins out. She still wants to rule a kingdom in Middle-earth. So, Galadriel sets off with her other, much, much better uncle, and she leaves the Undying Lands behind her. Which is kind of crazy because, again, she did not have to do this. Her own father begged her to return with him to paradise but she didn't do it. And instead, she journeyed away across the frozen sea. Her pride and her ambition effectively drove her to banish herself from heaven. But it does seem that the violence at Alqualonde truly did affect Galadriel, 
because when she does finally arrive in Middle Earth, she almost immediately passes out of the spotlight. For the rest of the First Age, she lies low. She meets and marries Celeborn of Doriath, and for 500 years, she lives a peaceful life there, in the kingdom of somebody else. There's also an extra fun fact here, because it's at this time that Galadriel learns to make Lembas. Now, throughout the following 7,000 years, Galadriel's ambition does seem to soften, and her wisdom seems to grow. Because during the Second Age, Galadriel is given Nenya, the Ring of Water, but she uses it only to preserve and defend that which is good. And despite the fact that Tolkien tells us she was the mightiest and fairest of all the elves that remained in Middle-earth, Galadriel was not mighty in the way that she and Feanor had perhaps once intended to be. She was no warrior. She doesn't fight in any of the wars of the Second Age, and she doesn't fight much in the Third Age either. Despite what the Hobbit movie would have us believe, by the Third Age, Galadriel's might is almost entirely founded upon her wisdom. And this is explicitly demonstrated when she and Celeborn come to live in the Golden Wood of Lothlorien. You see, when Galadriel and Celeborn first arrived there, the realm was ruled by an elf called King Amroth, and Galadriel was simply his guest. But when Amroth died, Galadriel had the perfect opportunity to declare herself the Queen of Lothlorien and to finally rule a kingdom the way she'd always wanted to since she first met Feanor. But she doesn't do it. She never declares herself Queen of anything. Instead, she is simply the Lady of the Golden Wood. She is its protector, but not its monarch. It seems that by the time the Third Age was in its prime and Galadriel was an ancient being, she had truly learned to place her wisdom over her ambition. That is, until she faced the ultimate test. So, in the year 3019 of the Third Age, this whole internal conflict that's defined Galadriel's character throughout her entire life suddenly comes full circle when Frodo Baggins arrives in Lothlorien. And as we all know, he brings with him the One Ring, a source of unlimited power. And Frodo offers this power to Galadriel freely. Now, in this moment, Galadriel is faced with the most important choice of her entire life. On the one hand, she could take the One Ring and claim immeasurable power to rule all of Middle-earth. As a queen, not dark but beautiful and terrible as the dawn, tempestuous as the sea and stronger than the foundations of the earth. Or, she could let it go. Ambition versus Wisdom. Now, we all know that in this moment, Galadriel does make the right choice. And this is the reason for her statement that she passed the test. Finally, her wisdom overcame her ambition. And so, this casts a whole new light on Galadriel's final scene in the Legendarium, only two years later. Because right at the end of Return of the King, Galadriel stands with the other ring bearers on the deck of the White Ship, and for the first time in millennia, she is able to return west, to sail home, and to end her 7,000 year long banishment. And so Galadriel does not return home in shame. She has nothing now to atone for. The misdeeds of her past are utterly redeemed, and she is free to diminish and go into the West and remain Galadriel. Now, when I first read The Lord of the Rings, I knew nothing of the Silmarillion, and so 
I assumed that Galadriel was just this inherently perfect character. But that's not the case. She's so much more interesting than that. Galadriel isn't great because she was born perfect. She's great because she made mistakes. And she learned from them. And those mistakes are what caused her to grow into what she finally became. The mightiest and fairest of all the elves in Middle-earth. So, thank you all very much for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, until next time, dear friends, much love, stay groovy, and Nevaya Melanine.